Okay. Yeah. Is, it, is it clear enough? Which is can be two colored because basically every other triangle is an actual triangle, and every other triangle is a virtual triangle. So if, you can, so if, you, if it's made out of triangles, you can two color it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got my triangles. I think if it's only triangles, yes, but there might be shapes where there's not triangles. But there's another thing called Cauchy's Ridley here that says that convex shapes that have rigid faces. Thank you. All right. I guess I don't know. I, I don't think there's a way. So that's right. He's just on the stream, and then I'm going to call him in during the close session. That's that's, that's why. Idea? That's why. Okay. Hey. How's it going? Good to see you. Okay. So you're saying you guys out the pool this summer? Yeah, it's <laughs> earlier in the summer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My wife was uh, just. Uh, yeah, well, so then, like, so yeah, like, she just went back to school today. So she was like, oh, we really should the pool. Yeah, my wife's in middle school. Oh, right. So, uh, which, which school? Cupertino Union School District, oh, Sunnyvale okay. School. But then this is no longer rigid. So, yeah, it sort of feels over. So there's this constraint on rigidity. I feel like the acceleration. I know buildings. And there's a lot less people around during the site. Yeah. yeah. And it sounds like it's actually a pretty respectable yeah. case. Yeah, I think and sorry, one more. condition is that every mm -hmm. vertex has to have an even degree because you have to have kind of two triangles. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. we're yeah. just at the yeah. live stream yeah. going, and we can just walk around the live stream, yeah. and then we switch it so, directly. Uh, so, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. so, yeah, I don't know how important this is, but you can also take like that. That's not a good It's like a hexagon and make triangles. Oh, wow. popular. That satisfies. Oh, really? Oh, really? Last Friday, and we just had to wait for it to reboot. Because all those spaces are. I can't believe that's still happening. That's been going on for months. So, so it, probably some, you can sometimes watch that little thing over there, and it'll say um, uh, shutting down, and you can interrupt it before it does that. <laughs> Maintain eye contact, but maybe. <laughs> Uh, I'll have one eye on the slide and one eye on there, and uh, I'll just point to it if, if I notice it. Yeah. Um, it'll just one button will show up, and um, the rest I think is great. Just cancel it. Yeah. So frustrating. I called a number and whoever, like, I left a message and they never called me back. It just depends on this, like, the so bad. I've been in others and I can find them all the time. So it's like a, I don't know, a sphere. It's too. Okay. I think if it detects inactivity on a particular slide. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I know most everyone here, but just in case I haven't met you before, I'm Alice Nokamura, and I'm really pleased to be Laura Blumenshine's PhD advisor. So, um, working with Laura has been absolutely amazing, as, as many as you, of you know. Uh, she works hard and she works fast. <laughs> so, a little bit of background on Marcy. <laughs> She uh, did her undergraduate at Rice University, and I have to give a brief shout out to Marcy O'Malley, who uh, Laura's known since she's undergraduate, did her master's research at the Rice Lab, and uh, Marcy O'Malley's group and mine also collaborate pretty closely now, and I've known her a long time. And Marcy called me and said, I have this amazing master's student who should really do a PhD with you. And of course, that was Laura. I should say Marcy's also sent me other students as well. So I owe her big time. And uh, one of the other amazing things that Marcy did, and maybe this is a big part of where Laura gets her selflessness and agreeability in terms of working with others, is uh, Marcy said, well, Laura had an NSF fellowship, a National Science Foundation fellowship. But, you know, I told her to save it for the PhD. So I'm funding her for her master's so that she can keep it for the PhD, wow. which is totally amazing. And uh, I think that that sort of um, attitude and selflessness uh, has uh, is just reflected in, in Laura and everything she's done with us. Uh, so anyway, she came from Rice, uh, joined us post-master's here at Stanford. And uh, usually I try to roast my students a little bit before the PhD. <laughs> and then last week, what am I going to say about Laura? So I even approached Laura and said, what kind of dirt can you give me? And Laura said, you know, I'm not going there. What is she going to I stopped short of emailing the parents. Uh, so, uh, uh, did not dig up very much. But I will say one of the things that's been amazing about Laura is how fast she has gone through the PhD. Of course, she came post-master's. But it's been uh, three years and one quarter since she started in my research lab. And so I'm going to attribute the relatively short period of time to why I don't have enough dirt on Laura. <laughs> and I should say it wasn't even really three years and one quarter because she did do a summer internship at Facebook Reality mm. Lab. So if you subtract off a quarter, it's pretty much a, a, a speed record. Uh, but of course, Laura is not sacrificing um, uh, quality for, for speed. And has done a lot of really amazing things. And um, oh, I didn't mention one other thing, which is those of you who have been keeping score, we have a lot of graduates in my lab this year. And so actually, out of the people that walked in graduation this year, uh, Laura is the is the fourth to defend and will be finishing her PhD this summer. Uh, and then we also have two more PhD defenses next week and one a week after, if anybody wants to really get to know the Charm Lab. <laughs> okay, but back to Laura and her. Her uh, amazing work is uh, when uh, she first came to Stanford, um, I was just returning from a quarter abroad in Japan. And uh, the first thing she did when she came to the lab was she dove right in working very closely with Elliot Hawks. He was a postdoc. I would be surprised if he's not mentioned <laughs> also later in the talk, uh, as well as Joey Greer, my uh, uh, former PhD student in the lab. And uh, I had actually gone to Japan and left Elliot in charge of the lab, and I came back, and suddenly everybody was doing vine robots. <laughs> like even people that were supposed to be working on needle steering were doing vine robots. <laughs> and then I said, "Well, don't fight it. Just go with the flow. New graduate student comes in, vine robots." <laughs> and now Laura is the the senior graduate student on this on this vine robots project, and has really been um, pulling it together and uh, being the, the kind of ongoing resource in our lab for that. And the amazing thing is that this, this cool project, and many of you have collaborated on it and worked on it with us, um, is that like, things that we dreamed would happen in the beginning actually happened. And a lot of that is due to Laura. Like we put a graphic like this, that our robot would go and tie itself around something and pull on a valve. And then Laura, along with her collaborators, like made it happen, not to, not to steal our thunder. And this is actually my favorite, because I think the very first week in the lab, I was like, Laura, make it tie itself in a knot. And she did make that happen, but it was very hard, a very manual process. And that was impressive. She dove right in and made it happen. And then in the very last thing she did in her PhD thesis was make a much more elegant, automated knot, as you'll hear about it. So it's just amazing because Laura's one of those students that takes the crazy things I put in grant proposals and actually makes them into, into physical reality and, and math reality as well. 
And all along, you know, while she's working hard and working fast, that, that's not the only thing she's doing. Um, she's a media darling, along with Margaret and many other students in the lab. Um, this is probably one of at least five or six times television cameras have been trained on, on Laura and her collaborators. Uh, so hopefully we'll, this will be on a TV sometime soon near you. Um, and then also doing lots of outreach and demos for other people. And one of my favorite demos that Laura, I think along with Margaret and Nathan, did was this uh, Stanford Splash event. And I love, it's a little small, it says here, soft robots are changing the world, world and are huggable. Yes. <laughs> so, so it's just a really fantastic way that Laura has of being able to communicate her research, get other people involved, and get people excited. And in addition, she's been a wonderful friend to lots of people in the lab, of course, has given uh, lots of wonderful presentations, has been a great travel buddy, visiting countries all over the world to, to give talks, attend bars, play foosball, <laughs> whatever, whatever it might be. Laura's been a fantastic companion uh, for everyone in our research group. And with that, we're really excited to hear about your PhD work. Uh, and I'll just make one note, which is um, Elliot Hawks, which is the fifth <laughs> member of the committee, is on uh, is is, is uh, attending via video stream. So, in case you are a graduate student wondering where's that fifth member of the committee, he's there. He's just online. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's okay. Get all the secrets. <laughs> Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, thanks, Allison, for the introduction. Uh, like Allison said, I'm going to be presenting my dissertation work today, uh, which is titled Design and Modeling of Soft Growing Robots. Uh, so, to start, I'm going to focus on understanding that description in the title, uh, Soft Growing Robot. So traditional robots are uh, made up of rigid links with joints between them. Uh, this rigid structure means the robots can follow very precise paths with uh, both high precision and accuracy, uh, making them highly suited for repetitive tasks like factory assembly and other, other places where we see uh, robots a lot. However, when the environment is unknown or changes for some reason, traditional robots have to often have difficulty adapting to their environments uh, and can potentially get involved in situations where they injure either the environment or themselves. One way uh, that has been developed recently of working around this problem and moving towards more adaptable systems uh, has been in the field of soft robotics. So what is uh, soft robotics? Soft robots are made of flexible and deformable materials, uh, which can use their natural compliance to respond to unknown environments. So this means instead of a set of joints, soft robots work uh, by deforming their bodies, like you see here, uh, in order to move. Uh, the form of the body itself determines the movement of the robot when it's actuated. So this means that often soft robots take their inspiration from animal forms and behaviors. So this soft fish tail allows the robot to perform a sharp turning maneuver like you might see in a fish. Uh, other robots, like the octa-arm robot here, can perform wrapping grafts like an elephant trunk or an octopus tentacle. And then you get even kind of more interesting designs, like this one's a little hard to see, but it's a worm robot that is performing peristaltic movement. Uh, soft robotic structures can even extend in length, so the octa-arm here can stretch its body by a few percentage. Uh, by actuating together, uh, while concentric tube robots, like here in the right corner, uh, can extend by a few times their initial body length. But if we think back to that initial title that I gave for this talk, soft growing robot, uh, neither of these robots really are exhibiting that form of growth. So this extension is somewhat limited, and in this thesis, I'm instead going to look at a robot that com combines the compliant nature of soft robots with an indeterminate uh, growth potential that plants use uh, so that it can change its length by hundreds of times. So let's look at what this growth actually does in plants. Uh, so why is growth an interesting behavior to replicate? A number of cells, some of the examples seen here uh, in nature, 
grow in order to move through their environment, and they share a similar form of growth, which is that they add material at the tip, at the most distal section of the body. So here, neuron cells grow through packed tissue in order to connect two locations and pass a signal between those locations. Uh, pollen tube cells uh, grow down from the top of a plant stem into the body of the plant in order to deliver pollen. And then sporenchyma cells, that's a fun word, uh, support uh, the growth of plants in the vertical direction by extending through the stem of the plant and stiffening. So these examples share a few key features, uh, which are also shared by the growing robot that I'll be looking at in this presentation. Those features are that by lengthening from the tip, these systems are able to have relatively easy movement through constrained environments because their bodies don't move with respect to the environment. And then as they're moving, they create this structure along the path, which connects the base wherever they start to some target out in space to the tip of the robot. This structure can be used for support, as you can see as this system kind of jumps this gap to get to its intended target. Uh, so there have been a few uh, previously uh, demonstrated artificial tip growth systems, and these have been achieved through two different methods represented by the schematics here. So this first method, the body is made of a linear filament which is pulled through the interior and is used to construct the tube body of the robot. So essentially this looks like this, where the body is 3D printed as the robot is grown. Uh, it's 3D printed from the tip. So this means you can change the shape by relatively adding material to one side or the other. And the second way, uh, material is already preformed into a tube shape, and then it's pulled through the center uh, and inverted or turned uh, right side out, inverted or turned right side out at the tip once it gets there. Uh, this method can produce much faster growth since the body is already formed. Uh, and this uh, method has been used in uh, both the, the robot uh, in this thesis and also in a, a few other systems uh, which have been developed for search and rescue, medical applications, uh, growth into soil, all sorts of other uh, applications. So for our system, this is the simplest rep representation of our soft growing robot. It is a thin plastic or fabric tube that is inverted using internal pressure. Uh, the robot is soft because it's using this flexible tubing and an inflated body. Uh, and in this video, you can see how it has this form of growth from the tip as the body stripes stay still and the tip moves forward into space. So. Uh, because growth is relatively unstudied in the literature, uh, in this thesis, I look at kind of the whole gamut, uh, design, modeling, and also application of this robot. Uh, so I believe by developing models for a soft growing robot and creating designs that expand its capabilities, uh, we can create devices that uh, can use growth to tackle more difficult problems in search and rescue, medicine, inspection, and more. So this leads into the overview of my presentation today. Uh, so my thesis contributions are broken down into four parts. Uh, I'll start with a model of growth as a form of movement. Then I'll show some demonstrations that the unique behavior of growth can achieve. Uh, I'll follow this up with a model of the kinematics of steering or shaping the robot, which allow us to predict the robot shape from the shape of actuators. Finally, I'll look at an application for the soft growing robot that follows both this growth and this steering that I'll talk about in order to create antennas that can be reconfigured. So first I'll jump into this quasi-static model of growth. So why do we need a model of growth in our robot? So we want to understand both the capabilities and the limitations that growth provides. Meaning more simply, we want to know when is the robot going to be able to grow and when are the features in the environment or in the robot going to stop it. To do this, we use a quasi-static model to replace, uh, relate the output, which here is growth, to the input pressure. Uh, quasi-static here means that we essentially treat the system as if it's stationary, even when it is moving. Uh, we can do this by ignoring the acceleration and the mass of the robot, since it's relatively small on our system. 
a situation that the robot might grow through might look like this. Um, growing through some obstacles uh, and taking on a certain shape with its body. <coughs> Uh, besides the velocity and the pressure, which is the input, um, the model takes into account the shape of the path that the robot takes. So the shape determines where new material is going to travel to get to the tip. And it also takes into account the environment, and specifically the environment that the tip of the robot is encountering. Uh, for most situations, we actually want to know the pressure that causes the robot to grow. So we usually rewrite the model and the equations we'll be looking at as solving for pressure as a function of the other properties. So I'll start by examining the growth component of this model and the environment. Uh, so essentially, we're going to leave off the path-based component, which is just the shape of the robot to begin with. So these terms we refer to, because they're all the terms without the path in them, as the path-independent terms. So from the environment, we get two, uh, two considerations. Uh, we look at the surface friction, uh, which the robot is growing through. And we also look at the cross-section that the robot encounters as it grows. Uh, and then we also have these effects of growth alone. And specifically, we want to look at the velocity dependence of the robot as it grows. So I'll jump right in to the first experiment that we ran. And we started by testing the environmental friction effects on growth. So we grow a robot between two plates, which are coated with different materials. So here we look at an adhesive material like tape, uh, a high friction material like rubber, and then a low friction material, Teflon. We change the pressure P in the robot so that it continues growing between these surfaces uh, slowly, but doesn't stop growing. For comparison, we also looked at the situation that would happen if we were moving the body relative to these, these plates. Uh, so this would be if the robot actually was moving its body, uh, what, what would the situation here be? Um, so here we just inflate the robot to a pressure that is around the average of the, the growth pressure in the first part, uh, and we pull and measure the force that it takes to pull the robot body into the gap. Here are the results, the forces for each test. Uh, growth here, uh, the top one is in the solid lines, and then the pull test is in the dotted lines. The color represents the different material that we line the gap with. You can see quite uh, clearly right away that on the pull test, the length of the gap and also the material had a big effect on the forces that we see. However, if we look at the growth test, we see that with some amount of noise on top of this, there is very little variation in the force that we need to grow through this gap. So this is a really exciting result, uh, even though it kind of is a nothing result, in that this means that the robot can actually grow through just about any environment with regards to the surface properties of the environment. Uh, a fact that we'll see demonstrated later on in the section, second section of this talk. So the other environment property that we wanted to look at was the cross section <laughs> that you have to grow through. So you can essentially think if this cross section is smaller than the robot, it's going to have to squeeze down into that hole in order to keep growing. So here we grow a normally round tube into a gap that decreases in height the further you grow in. Uh, flattening out the tube, kind of shown in this cross section here, and decreasing the area but maintaining the same perimeter. So we measure the pressure to grow at each decrease in area uh, and perform this initially with three sizes of tube that have the same wall thickness. The results are shown here. So uh, here we plot pressure versus one over area, and we see that there is a linear trend. So this might seem like a somewhat interesting way to plot this, uh, but if we fit a line to this data, we can see that this represents a yield force that is constant as the robot grows into smaller and smaller gaps. Uh, so rewritten, this means that our driving force, which is our pressure times our area, is equal to this constant yield force which is independent of the cross-section area. Uh, interestingly, uh, the yield force is the same for the three diameter tubes. Um, 
which all shared the same material thickness, uh, but uh, didn't shame, share the same initial area. So we investigated this further by testing more wall thicknesses. Uh, you see quite a, a large range of order of magnitude of wall thicknesses here. And we see that each of them have this, this similar linear trend, but a larger wall thickness results in a much higher slope on the system. If we plot those slopes, those yield forces, we can see that there is a linear trend versus wall thickness. So essentially, we now have this yield force as a function of one of the material properties or geometric properties of the robot. Uh, I think more is needed to confirm exactly what this relationship is. It seems to be linear, but, um, but I, I think more tests would be needed. Uh, and to tell whether this yield force uh, varies with any other properties of the robot. However, we see that even in a wide range of different wall thicknesses, we get the same behavior. The last uh, path independent term is that one that is only dependent on the growth. So specifically the velocity dependency. Here we use a large pressure tank and a valve that's larger than the diameter of the robot to supply the pressure as it grows. Uh, this is done for two effects. So we want to reduce the fluid friction, uh, which might affect how fast the robot can grow. And we also want to supply a constant pressure as the volume changes. So the volume of the tube as it grows out is much smaller than the volume of the tank. If we plot the velocity versus the pressure, uh, we see again a linear trend that is offset from zero. So this is a viscoplastic relationship, which is similar to what is seen in plant cells. Uh, visco meaning there is a velocity-based fr viscous friction, and plastic meaning that there's this initial pressure offset. So rewriting this, uh, we can see that the, the plastic term is just the yield force again. Uh, and we can fit this model with an exponent on the velocity uh, since that is seen in plants. However, this exponent op ends up being pretty close to one. So it is essentially a linear term. And an exciting thing to note here is how fast we were actually able to get the robot to move. So fast running pace for humans is between about five and 10 meters per second. Uh, so that means this robot is actually moving much faster than even the world's fastest sprinters, though only for a very, very short section of it in our test. So that wraps up the path independent terms. Now I'll go through the path dependent terms, which really only have one component, and that is how much friction does it take to transport the material from the base to the tip? So this friction we look at in two regards, friction as a function of the length and friction as a function of the curves or curvature of the robot path. So first looking at the length, we directly measured the force to pull the tube against itself, looking at measuring the friction directly. It's important to note here that there is no eversion, no, none of that growing that we saw in all the other tests, and there's no pressure inside the tube in this experiment. Instead, we're essentially just imitating the state inside of the robot, and this was done uh, because, uh, as we'll see, the friction is relatively small in this test, and we actually weren't able to measure it over the variations in the yield force um, when we tried to do this in a growing situation. So we plot this force versus the length of interaction, and again, we can see a linear trend. Uh, here, we uh, assume that this linear trend is based off of the weight of the material, which is why it is uh, so small. Uh, and in fact, we can see some effects of this small friction with length in uh, this demonstration here. So here we extended a uh, system in a 28 centimeter base to a length of 72 meters. So this is a, a huge length change. And we can see that this is possible because the friction is very, very small um, and is really only limiting uh, our growth based off of how much material we can store in the robot at the beginning. The last uh, term of the model that we're going to look at is this curvature dependency. So this is the second effect of the friction inside of the body as it moves material. And we test this effect by forcing the robot to grow into this curved path uh, as it uh, moves forward. And we measure the re relationship between the length of this curved path and the pressure that it takes to grow. Again, uh, we tested with a few different situations. Here we changed that radii r um, 
of the path. So here are the results plotted, and you can see that we get less friction the larger that radius is, so essentially the larger the curve. This data shows an exponential relationship as the radius goes uh, as and as the radius goes up, like I said, the circle uh, or that uh, exponential term kind of expands downward, and so we get less friction. Um, this is actually an expected effect. This is very similar to uh, capstans, which are essentially pulleys with ropes wrapped around them, and uh, they can generate a ton of friction depending on how much you wrap. Um, so this result indicates that we need to think carefully about adding turns to our path since it can add a lot of uh, friction and stop the robot from growing further. So combining these effects, we see in uh, the full model where the pressure is the input to the system. Uh, the area A is based off of the path cross-section, and this is really the only effect of the environment that we have in our model here. Uh, these together make the driving force of our robot. Then we have the yield force and viscous damping, uh, which deal with the growth at the end and make up our path independent forces. And finally, we have our path length friction and our capstan friction, which again are the internal effects due to the path dependence of our robot. So this full model can be used to judge uh, whether certain paths are feasible, uh, whether we can generate a positive velocity given our pressure and what our robot can withstand, and also allows us to compare different paths and judge which ones are easier to achieve. Uh, since developing this model, it has been used to predict forces need to grow around curved paths uh, and has, uh, is starting to be integrated into a dynamics model, which is, I think, pretty exciting. So, when testing the growth model, we saw a hint of some of the interesting behaviors of growth, uh, especially in the surface friction test, and some of this interesting behavior with transport of material through the body. So next, I build on these demonstrations with a uh, with these observations with a set of demonstrations of growth, showing how growth represents a different way of moving through the environment. So again, just to kind of reiterate uh, what these different features of growth are. So since we are lengthening from the tip, this allows us to move easily with respect to the environment, and it allows us to build a structure along the path. So these are the two features that I'll be looking at in my demonstrations here today. Um, so starting with the movement through constrained environments, we saw previously in the modeling section how surface friction has very little effect. Uh, so here we kind of see this taken to the extreme where we can grow through uh, two incredibly sticky surfaces. These are fly paper or rat traps, uh, which the robot can even lift apart from each other as it grows forward. Similarly, we can also see that the robot easily deals with a sticky or viscous uh, liquid like glue, and uh, it even comes out the other side clean. So we see this line of glue, which was the last part in the, in the bath, I guess you could say. Um, and this is a behavior that is actually interesting because it could be used to keep certain areas sterile or separated from each other. Other sorts of constrained environments we can look at are uh, something like water, where the water itself can't support much lateral reaction forces uh, on the surface, which means that our robot is only able to move across this pond since it can transfer those reaction forces back to the base on solid ground. And for the last demonstration of constrained environments, we looked at sudden obstruction of the cross-section. So previously in the modeling, I grew into a gap, but here we're changing the cross-section all of a sudden from the full diameter of the tube to one-eighth of the diameter. Uh, but the robot, with a little bit of start and stop there at the beginning, is able to continue moving through this gap. So together, these four demonstrations of the constrained environment shows that there is uh, little to no effect depending on what an exact environment the robot is dealing with uh, in a lot of situations. So these indicate that the, the robot is a good uh, candidate for moving through a lot of unknown environments. Uh, we now look at the features of growth uh, in structure building, but before showing the demonstrations, I wanna quickly go through uh, how the shapes that I'm going to show were created and grown, since this uh, will come up later. 
Uh, so here we take a section of two, um, which normally would be inflated into a straight path, and we pinch a section uh, with a piece of tape. So here is the length of the pinched material. This length of pinch shortens one side relative to the other and causes this turn in the direction of the pinch. Uh, if we form these pinches and then grow the robot, we can see that the robot will slowly grow forward, but the turn will remain in the same place. So this allows us to create essentially deployable shapes that can be deployed as they go, a feature that you'll see in the demonstrations that I'll show here. So looking at how these now preformed shapes can be used as structures, uh, we can see that, oh, no, that's fun. Uh, we can see that the robot uh, can grow around and under this door and then be used to transfer forces uh, to this to this latch and turn off this uh, this smoke valve here. Uh, so this is interesting because the, the robot body doesn't have a lot of ability to generate this force itself, but we can locate some sort of big motor outside the door and use the, the robot's ability to get under and into this situation to uh, transfer that force to such a distal location. Uh, a similar sort of uh, transportation can be seen in this demonstration where we transport water and we're transporting this inside of the body of the robot. Here it is grown with the water and then the fire uh, that we're trying to fight uh, is able to puncture, puncture a hole in the robot and put out the, the uh, release the water and put out the fire. Uh, so this allows us to imagine how we could transport other materials inside of the robot's body and possibly release them when we got to a set location. Um, another way to move uh, something internal to the robot body can be seen here, where we're moving a tool inside of the inner layer of the body. Uh, so this is an interesting use since, uh, let's see if you can, so here we'll see the robot grow out and then the tool comes out of the tip of the robot. This is an interesting use since the robot doesn't actually need to be broken or punctured like the previous demonstration in order to move the tool outside. The last way that I looked at that the robot can be used as a structure is uh, to support and form uh, payload uh, shapes. So here we show a robot uh, shaping a conductive element on the outside and supporting it in order to form a helical antenna. So this specific idea of structure use, I will be investigating more in the last section of this presentation. Uh, so to review the contributions of this section, we showed and explained demonstration both of growth through different environments, and we demonstrated four ways that the structure of the soft robot can be used to accomplish a task. So both of these sets of demonstrations uh, can be used to inspire potential applications of soft robotic growth in the future and to kind of see uh, what sorts of challenges uh, we can help to overcome. So the second demonstration set here, the structure growth, uh, involves shaping the robot for a tar target application and use relatively static shapes that were just thrown into. I were to expand on this capability, I wanted to look at shaping the soft robot further. Uh, and so in this next section, I looked at modeling the kinematics of the robot under generally routed tendon actuation, basically meaning different shapes of actuators on the robot body and how that affects the shape of the robot. <coughs> so giving a little uh, more in-depth motivation for this, uh, we investigated general shape change uh, because, like we saw in the previous section, we might want to deploy a specific antenna shape or a specific shape for a uh, target application. We might also want to wrap around an object and create an enclosing black grasp uh, to hold that object. Um, and then we might want to uh, make a functional shape uh, with the body like a knot, like uh, Allison alluded to. Um, and so what do we need to make this a reality? Uh, we need two things. 
So for a single generally routed actuator, which I'll explain more in a second, uh, we need a model, which allows us to take an actuator shape, like on the left there, and turn it into a robot shape. And then we also need to develop a design tool, which allows us to take a target shape that we want to hit, and turn it into an actuator design so that we can achieve that shape. So before moving on to the model itself, uh, I want to look briefly at the different types of actuation that we use and that we are modeling here. So extending somewhat on that pinching technique seen in the previous section, uh, here we extend that along an entire line drawn onto the surface. So you can see these kind of alternating red gaps over there on the left. And this is our actuator shape, uh, even though it's not really actuated in the traditional sense, drawn onto the tube. And then just like before, we're going to pinch the tube and hold that shape using tape. Um, so this creates kind of this single permanent shape, uh, but this is a useful tool both, as we saw previously, for de deploying uh, shapes when you know exactly what you need, and also uh, for doing tests on, uh, on our shape model. Uh, the other actuation types look very similar uh, in that, again, we're going to create a line of actuation, which we then can shorten. So here, we have a tender, tendon stopper actuation, which is a string or tendon routed through a series of Teflon stoppers. Um, these stoppers limit the local deformation when they're all brought together. Um, and then we can create a single shape uh, and we can have variable strain, meaning that in some sections we can have more area or more length between those stoppers and in other sections we can have less. Uh, the other active way that we implemented this shape change is using pneumatic artificial muscles. So these uh, shorten or extend with uh, pressure and uh, we can use them to evenly distribute deformation along the entire length that we apply them to. Um, so this one like I said, since it's evenly distributed deformation, we get a single strain along the entire length. However, by changing that pressure, we're able to get kind of this family of shapes from a single actuator. So uh, to kind of reiterate and go back to this picture that I used, uh, these actuators all form a similar set where, for example, the blue line here takes on a certain shape. We shorten that shape, uh, that, that shape on the robot, and we get a resultant uh, robot shape out. So the first thing that we looked at to make the model is exactly what you see here, uniform actuation. So we can take a helical path on the robot and we'll get a helical shape of the robot out. To start uh, building up this model, we need to define a lot of parameters and what, what makes up the actuator shape and what makes up the robot shape. So to start with, uh, the actuator parameters are going to be the diameter of the tube, uh, so what are you wrapping around, the angle of the blue line uh, at every point, um, and then also what we're going to call the strain or actuation ratio. So if it's not actuated and you're still in your original shape, that's <coughs> lambda equals one. And then once you start actuating, you've got a lambda less than one. The other parameters are on the fi final shape of the robot as it's pulled into this helix. So here we use kind of the standard parameterization of helix, which is the radius from a central axis and then the pitch parameter, uh, which is essentially the height you achieve as you rotate around uh, one time. Uh, here we have two different radii that are separated by the two. So you can see the blue path has the inner radii, ri, and then the outer radii measures that red path. Uh, which was opposite the blue path to start. So this allows us uh, three parameters for our actuator and three parameters for our shape. So now we just need to relate these to each other and we do this with a series of geometric constraints. So the first constraint here is the path length. So as I talked about before, um, this inner blue path has a lambda less than one, a strain of less than one. Um, 
And it turns out this outer red path uh, is the same as that original uh, path, blue path was. And so we'll have a lambda equal to one. Essentially, this means that the outer red path didn't shorten any as we pulled the robot into a helix. Um, uh, okay, there we go. Um, and so this means we can write this down where the ratio lambda between those two paths is equal to the path length of the helix on the inside versus the path length of the helix on the outside. The other constraints come from these cross sections of the backbone. Uh, these cross sections allow us to relate the inner and outer radius um, obviously by the tube diameter, since that separates those two paths. Uh, and it also allows us to make this second geometric constraint, where we see that the inner tangent uh, for that inner path and the tangent line for the outer path are always separated by the same angle to theta, where theta is that original angle we drew on the tube for our actuator. So rewriting that in terms of our helix parameters, we end up with this equation here. So this fully defines our entire problem, and we can get a uh, an analytic solution, uh, a fully or a fully defined solution from this set of three equations, which looks like this. Uh, so you can see that we have a set that takes the shape of the tube. Uh, the pitch and the radius and produces out the actuator parameters. And we also have a set of equations that we can solve for that takes the actuator parameters and produces the shape of the tube. So we next verify this model in a series of prototypes, which uh, when it's all laid out, looks like this. So here I created a set of static shapes using that preformed um, method that ranged from two degrees to 50 degrees in the angle of the actuator, and then a strain from 0.4 up to 0.75. Uh, so we can see that there's a huge range of shapes here, but how does this compare to the actual model that we had? So to measure that, we looked at validating the shapes that we actually have here, using a, a magnetic tracker to measure the shapes. So for the five degree row here, we can produce plots like this, where the dots here, uh, the yellow dots are the inner shape measured, the purple dots are the outer shape measured, and then the red and blue paths are the inner and outer predicted shapes from the model. Um, so we can see that uh, these fit pretty well. Uh, there's some more problems with the fitting when uh, you have less uh, path measured, like this 0.75. Um, uh, but overall, we see a good comparison between them visually. Uh, to compare them mathematically, uh, we look at measuring the distance between points, in, for example, on the purple path, and the corresponding points on the red path, and adding up these errors to get an average error of the shape. So this RMSE error uh, shows us how far those shapes deviate from uh, the expected shapes, and here we have really most of the uh, shapes in that grid over there having below 15 millimeters of RMSE error. Uh, so this is kind of obtuse uh, way to look at it, but essentially the shapes that we measured uh, were all about 30 centimeters long, and so that means over a 30 centimeter length, we only have uh, about a 5% error in the shape, which is on par with a lot of other prediction measure uh, uh, methods for general shape actuation like this. Uh, there is one that kind of sticks out, this first one here. You get a much higher error there. Uh, and this corresponds to this shape here. When we look back at the data, uh, we actually found that this made sense since this shape is in self-collision, uh, which means that uh, the shape wants to kind of squish down to an even smaller spiral than it is shown there, but it's stopping itself. Uh, so this is an edge case that we really don't predict in the model right now, but the model is able to tell us when this will happen. Uh, so we looked at kind of these single helical shapes, but how do we extend this to a more general model? 
to get some inspiration, we can start by looking at an example here. So what if we, instead of just taking a single helix, took a set of different helices and just stitched them together? Uh, and we could get something like this. So we started with 10 degrees, we moved to 5 degrees, and we moved back to 10 degrees. And we got a much less uniform shape, even with a small amount of change of the actuator shape. Um, so this gives some inspiration for how we're going to treat general actuator paths. Um, and that is that we think of them as a set of essentially infinitesimally small helices, or finitely small for the actual uh, application that we, we show here. So we make the parameters a function of the length of the tube, and at each point we can see that we'll have a theta value that is tangent to that actuator path. Um, and then you can kind of see it in this light blue and dark blue line, you'll have a, a lambda value at each point. Uh, we also have this phi of s, which allows us to, to better uh, plot, and it's essentially counting up you know, integrating that theta over the entire tube length. So like I said, for practicality, we don't actually consider infinitesimally small sections of tube. Instead, we look at finite sections. Um, and so we add an extra parameter, which is the length of the tube section uh, that each theta and lambda is applied for. The last thing to construct this general model is uh, this math math filled slide here. Uh, the, the details of this are not uh, actually that important. All this is allowing us to do is connect ends of those helices together. So this matrix here and the, the equations in the bottom basically tell our model how to hook up one helix to the next one as we go. So we can, just like we validated the uniform model, we can validate this general model. So we tested again kind of this pre program shape first. Uh, here in the top is essentially you take the tube, you cut a slit in it, you lay it flat, and this is the shape of the actuator on the tube. So I pointed out there that's the full tube circumference. So this is pretty close to a straight path, but we just kind of like flattened it out on the top, and the model predicts that we're going to get this shape this kind of spiraling up and then flattening out shape. And if we actually um, make this uh, actuated shape, we see that we get very, very similar uh, results. And again, we don't want to just trust our eyes, so we measure this using a magnetic tracker. Uh, and we can see that there's a, a very good match uh, with a RMSE error of uh, about five millimeters, uh, which again, for the size of the shape is very good. We also wanted to test this for actuated shapes. So here again, we can kind of see the actuator path once we cut this tube and lay it flat. Uh, and this is the shape of a sine wave. So this is like a, a pretty uniform looking shape to, to our eyes. Um, but we can see that it actually performs uh, a kind of non-uniform curling up maneuver when you actuate it uh, here using what are called series uh, pneumatic artificial muscles. Um, so uh, here using a motion tracker to track different points along the body at different strains, uh, we can see that, again, with the dots as the measured points and the line as the model, we get a good fit between uh, the, the design and the actual model predicted. So as I said at the kind of top of this section, we wanted both a model and a design tool. So this kind of ends the, the model section, and now I'm going to move into how we made this model into a design tool. So to do that, we essentially had to find what a good actuator to produce a desired shape is. So for example, if we're trying to match this knot shape here, uh, for each segment of the robot, we want to find a theta and a lambda value that minimize the error. Um, and to make sure that we're not kind of minimizing the error for a local section but causing ourselves problems down the road, uh, we look at the next n and the three here uh, sections when fitting each one. Uh, so we do start by fitting an orientation, but we only do this for the first section. 
And then we repeat this along the entire length of the target shape. You can see we're stepping our way through each of the sections. So uh, this allows us to uh, exactly, like I said, match that dot target shape. And these are actually the resulting fitted points and the resulting tendon shape that the algorithm wants us to make in order to fit this knot path. And we can see that if, if we do make the target shape, we do in fact tie ourselves into a knot. And in fact, this knot is uh, very similar to the knot we were trying to tie um, with some sort of a little bit of variation at the end there. Um, so this shows that uh, we're able to use these models to also design actuation paths. And we can make this into an active actuator as well. Uh, and this actuation also shows an interesting interaction between growth and steering. So specifically, this knotted path has something that we didn't see in any of the other paths, which are self-crossings. So you can see in the bottom, while we're waiting for the top video to catch up, that the, uh, the knot, when you pull it, doesn't form into a knot if you pull it after growth. This makes sense because it has to kind of pop it through itself in order to make that shape. But if we're growing, we're able to uh, make those self crossings as we grow. However, the growth is much slower, which as we talked about earlier in the modeling section is because of all those curves that we put uh, using our actuator. So this will be an interesting thing to uh, look at later down the line, uh, trying to figure out kind of that right uh, uh, matching of these curved paths and how we can apply them to that uh, fact that we really don't want as much curvature in our robot as it grows. So uh, with this shape actuation here, um, we're able to kind of start to achieve some of those shapes we talked about in the demonstrations. And so with that, uh, this last section looks at applying the knowledge that we gained from both the growth model and demonstration sections and the kinematic steering section in order to uh, apply the robot to form reconfigurable antennas. So going really quickly through uh, what is this application of reconfigurable antennas. So there's a lot of shape change that exists in the antenna literature. Um, and this shape change uh, is used for two features. So either we're creating this kind of unfolding shape that's used for deployment, or we're creating some sort of moving and changing of our antenna shape relative to maybe a ground plane. And this is used for reconfiguring the antenna properties. Antenna properties being what frequency are we trying to hit, how steered is our beam, you know, other, other things like that. Um, so our robot kind of already achieves the first one of these goals, deployment. We saw that in the video of growing to 72 meters. We can start from a very small package and we can grow out into a much larger package. Um, however, the second one, reconfiguration, uh, is interesting uh, because we need to figure out how to target those antenna shape changes with our robot shape change. So in this section, I'll look at two different ways that we made it reconfigure antennas. Using growth to make a monopole antenna uh, and using steering, which we talked about in the previous section, to use a, to make a uh, helical antenna. So focusing first on this monopole antenna application. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting information here but uh, about monopole antennas, but the only one that's really relevant for us is that the resonant wavelength is a function of the antenna length. So this means that we can change the behavior of our monopole antenna just by changing the length. So this allows us to create this design where we have this copper on the outside of the robot that is broken from the copper on the inside of the robot, which gives us a conductor that is the same length as however long the robot is. Um, so this means we can control the length of the antenna directly with the length of our robot, which looks like this. So as it lengthens, each conductor kind of pops out over the end of the robot. And if we instead pull the robot, we can see that we change this, we reverse this process. And using copper as our conductor, we can see this actually works. So 
Uh, there's a lot of lines going on in the plot, but basically what you need to see is that each of these peaks, which represent our resonant frequency, move back towards the, uh, the, the y-axis there as we increase the length of the robot, which is exactly what would be predicted if the length of our robot is targeting that antenna resonant frequency directly. Um, we can also control this behavior. So uh, we can measure that resonant frequency in real time and use that to either grow or shorten the robot. And you can see here it's been targeted to this kind of very, uh, very uh, high or low frequency behavior, and so uh, or high frequency behavior. And so we can we can grow into it over and over and over again. Uh, and we can see that there's not much degradation um, with the repeated growth or uh, retraction. So second, looking at a slightly more uh, difficult reconfiguration, uh, we look at the helical antenna. So here, uh, again, lots of information about how helical antennas are used in radio communication in the spacecraft, uh, but the important point here is uh, one major use of them is in a directed, circularly polarized uh, form, uh, where the twist of the antenna creates either a right-handed or a left-handed polarization of the signal. Uh, and so in order to achieve this, knowing what we do from the previous section on the kinematics of sh uh, shape change, uh, we chose the tendon stopper implementation to uh, achieve our shape change for our robot here, uh, because these stoppers are essentially mechanically invisible when unactuated and allow us uh, to limit local strain when they are actuated. And this is behavior that's reflected in the electromechanical domain, uh, if we code these in copper, where they're essentially transparent to the operating wavelength when they are pulled apart. And then when they are pulled together, they become a responsive EM device that we can actually use to create our antenna. So these two together uh, give us a sense of how this uh, actuation will occur. Uh, but how do we get the shape change? So we can see that essentially with a single actuator, we get a single uniform shape when we pull it all the way to an extent. To get more than one shape, what we do is we multi-route the antennas. So on the left part of this picture, we see one actuator. And then we extend it back out and pull a different actuator to achieve a different shape. If we do this instead with our right-handed and our left-handed uh, helices, we get this crossing of our paths. Uh, and this allows us to change from one shape to the other as we pull the different actuators. So uh, quickly going through how we kind of design these shapes. Uh, as we went through in the previous section, there are these uh, equations that relate our actuator parameters to our helical parameters, uh, our radius and our pitch. Um, and on top of these equations from the previous section, we added a few more that deal with the application. So we need a certain radius to hit our target frequency. Um, here, lambda, unlike the previous section, lambda is our target wavelength. So we've replaced our previous lambda with gamma. Um, and then uh, our pitch is limited by these two extremes. So on the left, we can't let it go into self-interference. And on the right, we want it to be less than uh, our radius over four um, to get the best erectivity of the antenna. So this creates these different sh uh, shapes of our potential uh, uh, actuator parameters. Um, but the shapes themselves aren't really that important. What's important is uh, kind of these projections. So which theta and gamma, which uh, angle and strain can we use to produce uh, shapes, and what target frequencies are those shapes going to hit? Uh, so we can see that as we increase the diameter, we kind of limit the range of target frequencies that we can hit. So for our application, we chose this smaller diameter and chose a uh, theta of 2.5 degrees and a strain of about 0.5 degrees to create our antenna. So prototyping with those uh, features, we get this antenna where uh, over on the left, you see both the right and the left-handed configurations, which uh, were measured by uh, Lucia Gann over in the electrical engineering department. 
uh, in, uh, to get their full far field uh, capabilities. Uh, namely, uh, we can see that in the simulation, the right-handed configuration and left-handed configuration have different responses to the right circularly polarized RCP and the left circular, circularly polarized uh, signals, um, which we can see also in our measurements where we get a 10 decibel drop uh, between the polarizations for the right polarized and a six decibel drop for the left polarized. Um, so just to go over uh, what we saw in this section, we saw both a monopole antenna that had controllable frequency reconfiguration along a wide range of frequencies, and a helical antenna where we were able to create these polarizing, uh, polarization switching between the two shapes. Um, so I'll move on quickly from this into a conclusion for this talk. Um, so in this talk, to summarize the contributions, uh, we showed a quasi-static model of the version-based growth as a form of movement, taking into account both growing cost of material transport and losses to the environment. We demonstrated some of the features we saw in this initial model, uh, both in response to the environment and in structures that could be grown and used for different applications. We developed a kinematics model of generally routed tendon actuation to uh, do things like tie a robot into a knot or to target other shapes. And then we use the lessons learned in all of these previous sections to uh, target an application of inversion-based growth uh, for deployable and reconfigurable antennas where we showed both a frequency changing monopole antenna and a handedness switching helical antenna. Um, Looking at future directions that I think this uh, work could take, um, the first one is kind of looking at some of those modeling and specifically looking at treating those growth models and steering models together. So I separated them into two different sections, uh, but as we saw, they really interact a lot, uh, and especially in the, the curvature kind of component. And so uh, combining these together, I think would allow us to much more smartly uh, uh, plan how the shape of the robot should take through space. Uh, as well, uh, talking about the modeling in the kinematics, I had to limit myself to a single actuator, but you can do a lot of interesting things, including creating lots of different shapes uh, with a single robot if you have multiple actuators. So here, we've got two actuators, you can kind of barely see it, and together they're forming this spiral shape. Uh, and you can imagine using uh, three or more actuators to form a whole range of shapes with a single robot. Uh, and lastly, uh, this is kind of looking at some of the work that's already happened and how it might uh, evolve into the future. Uh, I want to look at how some of the modeling uh, in this work could be applied to more growing robot applications. Uh, so for example, here we've got a video uh, that Marta Code took in Peru of the robot being used for an archeological dig. Uh, and I think that more of these kind of out in the real world uh, environment applications uh, could be informed by taking into account some of the, the work in this thesis. Um, and so with that, I'll go through right on to acknowledgements, uh, the part everyone comes through uh, for I've, I've heard. <laughs> um, so first, of course, I want to uh, thank my whole committee uh, for setting aside time to come to my presentation today. Uh, Michael, uh, thank you for chairing my defense uh, today. I really enjoyed your uh, decision making under uncertainty class. Uh, and even though there's not much uh, POM DPs in this presentation here, <laughs> if any. Well, come uh, up in the closed uh, session. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Uh, I, I do think that maybe there's some way in the future to mix uh, growing robots and POM DPs. Um, Mark, uh, thanks for being on my reading committee. Uh, I really appreciated all of the thoughtful comments you had in the Greenlight meeting uh, and some of your uh, excitement about the new directions that growing robots uh, could go really got me excited as well. Uh, Sean, thank you for just all of the uh, comments and uh, contributions in buying robot meetings. Uh, I think some of the probing questions you would ask always led uh, to new research directions and new ways of looking at the problem. Um, and uh, for Elliot, who's 
uh, looking at the live stream, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for, for taking me under your wing uh, when I first started at Stanford and kind of teaching me both the exciting world of growing robots and also about rapid prototyping and just making it work. Uh, and uh, even after you left Stanford, uh, you always were responsive to emails or questions I had uh, and had a lot of thought and care that really helped me polish my work. Uh, and lastly, Allison, I can't thank you enough for giving me the opportunity to be in the Charm Lab and here at Stanford. Uh, you've been a great sounding board uh, for ideas, and as you kind of alluded to, you always push me to do more interesting things uh, with the work, like tying a knot, uh, which as the first time I mentioned it for this last section of the work, uh, I knew that I was in trouble because you were so excited that I, I had to do it. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I think you've also been so thoughtful and, and caring and listening to kind of what my goals for the future are, especially when I didn't wasn't so sure and helping me, you know, do things like the summer internship to uh, figure out uh, what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, and I'll always remember the, the Skype call that we had uh, before I, I started here, where uh, you asked if I wanted to work on this new idea that you had for a plant robot and it was going to be revolutionary. And I was a little skeptical at the time, but uh, you'll see where I ended up, and it turns out that you were completely right. It was a, it was a great project to work on. Um, for uh, Thank you to all CHARM members, past and present, for all the, uh, the help, the support, the conversations, the, uh, the fun activities that have gone us out of the lab uh, over the years. Uh, Big thanks to everyone on the MindRobot team, which is so much bigger than when I started, uh, and, and all of the kind of meetings that we've had where we've been able to bounce ideas off of each other. Uh, big thanks to, uh, to especially to Joey for letting me crash into his growing robot party uh, right when I started. Um, thanks to, uh, to uh, Margaret and Margaret and Nathan uh, for in-depth discussions of soft and growing robots uh, that had a big impact, especially on the last section uh, uh, or of the, the growing and steering section. Uh, thanks to uh, Melissa and Giada and Ming and Kyle for being a fantastic CDR office crew. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, Jake and Sophia and Kara and Mike and Cole for always distracting me from work when I should be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, Greg, thanks for being my partner in crime uh, over the last three years, even though most of the time you had to do it remotely. Uh, thanks for forcing me to go on fun vacations and for putting up with all the silly selfies that I wanted to take. Uh, and thanks for helping me, you know, read over important emails and not stress too much about deadlines. Uh, and for always keeping me sane with, uh, by sending me memes for encouragement, uh, watching just way too many TV shows with me, and always being up for going on new adventures. I love you. And uh, last but not least, thanks to all of my family uh, who have always been there and supported me over the years. Um, thanks to my, my three younger brothers uh, who uh, always know what silly things to say to make me laugh, uh, and they enjoy showing me new things like new music and TV shows that distract me. Um, <laughs> thanks to my grandparents uh, who always believed in me and were there to congratulate me for all my accomplishments along the way, uh, especially to my uh, grandma Blumenshine who always uh, helped me edit essays and uh, always said that all of her granddaughters were gonna get PhDs and she was so proud. And to my uh, grandpa, Esbeck, who uh, says that I get all hit my smart games from him. Uh, and finally, thanks to my parents, who have always supported me, uh, flying out here twice in three months to come to my defense and my graduation, uh, helping me with advice on all the little adult things that pop up in life, uh, and always being excited when I have a new accomplishment in research, uh, even though you didn't always know what it meant, but hopefully you understand most of it now. <laughs> Uh, and uh, your support really means the world to me, uh, and I really uh, believe that I'm only here today uh, because of all the encouragement that I had from you over the years uh, to follow my goals and achieve uh, what I could be. So without further ado, I'll take any questions. Now take 
questions from the general audience, and then after that, uh, we will have a closed session for the committee. So I'll let you pick whose yes. questions to answer. <laughs> Yeah, so um, essentially, uh, I didn't talk about it much here, but you can kind of change theta as fast as you want, but you can't suddenly swing to the other side of the tube. Uh, so that stops you from doing things like making S-shaped bends. Um, and I think that's something that you could kind of really target with like multiple actuation, but yeah, that's that's definitely a thing that we, we restricted the actuation. Um, yeah. Not going to leave it to the committee yet. Just yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I know for me, it took you a long time to make a lot of these. Uh, do you think there's ways to like automate it or ways to make hmm. that interesting? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Yes, there is hiding behind all of these slides. There is a lot of grad student time involved in making robots. Um, I think that uh, I would hope that there's there's got to be some way of not just automating the the design of the actuators, but also automating the um, manufacturing of the actuators. Uh, and I think that that would be a great application for kind of on the fly designing uh, out in the field if you weren't quite sure what robot you needed, uh, since they are so cheap and disposable. Yeah, great question. In your model, you had like the area and the radius curvature. Now, is that just at the tip? Like, do bends along the previous part of the robot affect like the friction? Is that taken into account in your model? Yeah, so uh, you're talking about this here? Yeah. Yeah, so um, these terms, so uh, the area is only at the tip. Uh, this is only kind of the effect of the, the environment right at the tip. This here, I didn't really talk about this, but you can see the sum. So this is over all of the paths along the entire robot body, each of the different curved sections you have. So you do have to account for all of that curvature. Um, so if you do have the kind of tail of the robot coming through, uh, this only depends where that material is. So as it passes some sections, then those don't matter anymore. Yeah. yeah. So um, sometimes the body of the sub-robot changes with the environment, so you don't really know where the tip of the robot ends yeah. up. How would you like to track the position of the tip? That's that's a really good point. Yeah. So this this model assumes that you know all of these features of your path, and that nothing nefarious happened in the environment that uh, can stop you from, from knowing the curvature and the length of your particular path. Um, I think one way to tackle this is uh, more sensing um, for this model specifically. So if we can just sense that curvature, uh, we should be able to keep this model working. Longer term, though, I think we we need some sort of sensing to know where the robot has gone, um, which will allow us both to kind of map the environment as we travel through it, and also get a better sense of how the robot can move and where it's at. Yeah. Julie, you want to go first? Um, how does your model change as you deploy and redeploy the robot and the plastic starts to weaken? Do you that at all yeah, that's that's a no. That's a really good question. Uh, so the biggest effect is on this yield force. So kind of the the robot gets in this happy uh, medium where it will grow. It will like grow along the same wrinkles over and over again. So the first time you grow it, this yield force term is actually a little higher than any of the subsequent times. Uh, so kind of to deal with that in this this modeling here, we only did robots that had grown at least once. Uh, but um, I think that is an interesting thing maybe to look at in the, in the future, uh, especially because with the plastic robots, after a few times, they're, they're done. They're, they've got holes in them. Can't use them much anymore. Yeah, um, I guess still on the slide, have you thought about the effects of the restriction on growth if, say, the fiber robots are going through a, a small gap and then it passes it, but then you still have like a section of the length 
Yeah, I, I think that uh, we've seen in some situations anecdotally, especially uh, in very small gaps, that that can affect uh, your material transport. So I think that you could make a, a uh, take that into account in your model somewhat in this, this like path length term. Um, but I think that the, the gap has to get pretty small before you start to see that effect. Yeah. So with that, we'll thank Laura. Yes. 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 Yes.